You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, From Los Angeles, California, and Maria Menounos, and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is AfterBuzz TV Showrunners. AfterBuzz TV Showrunners is a long-form interview series featuring television showrunners and creators. And now, from the world's number one TV after-show platform, this is AfterBuzz TV Showrunners. <laughs> oh man, and that is the song that you know is referencing Helix, of course. Welcome to the interview show, of course, this is After Buzz TV Showrunners. We're here joined together with our guest Steven Maeda. Yep. And I'm also here with my Helix panel. If you're listening to this podcast, you of course know who Steven Maeda is, and you know who we are, because we are your hosts of the Helix After Show here at After Buzz TV. I am Steven Lemieux, joined by Matt Lieberman. Hello. I'm Zach Wilson. Thanks for tuning in. And, and I'm Liz Rishmawi. What's up, guys? It's going great. I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to pick your brain a little bit. Guys, we have a special treat for you today because if you don't know who Steve Maeda is, Steve Maeda has a long outstanding career as a writer, executive producer, showrunner for many of your favorite series, including. You're too kind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Already. You have credits with Lie to Me as an executive producer, Helix, of course, Miami Medical. Um, you wrote on the X Files alongside Vince Gilligan. We talked about that a little bit before the show. You've just had an all lost. Lost. I know. I gotta bring up Pan Am. Pan Am. Pan Am. Yes. You've had an all around amazing career so far, and I'm excited to see where it's going because, guys, do we just want to say it at the same time? Helix was renewed for season two. All right. And season two. I'm excited because yeah. this is this two. is gonna be your first interview since the announcement. That's right, correct? Yep. Which means we're more awesome than everybody the else. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. It's good to know that we're <laughs> awesome, and you're awesome for getting a season two, a, a, a renewal. We're all so excited. So we excited. Love too, yeah, well obviously. deserved. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're and really I, excited about it. And we're also just going to say, because we just finished watching the season finale, we would be so pissed if there was <laughs> no season two with the way that crap left off. I mean, come on. It I'm was, just saying. It was, <laughs> it, it's an amazing finale. And, and honestly, like we would have been upset if there wasn't a season two, but I appreciate anyone who's willing to take the amount of creative risks that you guys did in this finale in blowing out the world. What I think this show does very very well and i want to know you know how much of this was in the conversation at, at at the outset is we drop in on people in a very difficult intimate situation that uh exposes a much larger global conspiracy so we have this very small story and we get to know our heroes and get to know you know how they feel about everything that's going on while giving a teasing this much larger arc and and this finale just kicks us into high gear showing how global it is how long they're going to be dealing with it you know how did when did this arc kind of come into being? I mean, we, it's something we always talked about from the very beginning, and um, part of what we wanted to do is is kind of confound expectations. And so yeah. we knew from the get-go that, you know, to come back to Arctic Biosystems and to have that be a second season was going to be something that was near impossible. And yeah. so very early on we decided, you know what, let's just let it run its course. We'll have the 13 episodes, and then we're just going to blow it up. And we'll take it in literally. a new direction, literally. And we'll take it in a new direction, <laughs> and we'll come up with something that will surprise people, and hopefully confound again, moving into a second season. Because everyone was like, "Oh, how can they possibly last?" Right. Um, yeah. And so we're like, "We're blowing it up." You right. literally so do it. Literally, blew literally it up. blown it yeah. up. <laughs> so this this last episode, I mean, I'm still kind of chasing my coattails right now, trying uh, to get my head around everything yeah. that oh, went yeah. around. Sure. Um, you really kind of killed Hataki's emotions this last episode. <laughs> He's, he's dealt with, um, of course, his son Daniel dying in the last episode. Right. Now this episode, he has his wife pretty much have her throat slit right in yep. front of him. Um, what, what's, or Hitaki. Yeah. 
I know we don't see Hitaki in the future part of this. What, where do you see his character kind of going? Because he's always been that. He's always had an arc that's 500 years long. Mm -hmm. He's gone from the, for the benefit of science, um, put the human on the back burner, and now he kind of changed, and I think it was really Jane that changed him. Where can we really see his character going in the future? I think Ataki, he's, he's one of the more interesting characters on the show because, uh, for me anyway, and, and Hiro, I think, really brings this to the character as well. Hitaki is this guy who you, you think initially that he's just a villain, that he's he's kind of twirling his mustache and that right. he's going to be our guy who's who's getting in our way and, and confounding our heroes. And then you find out that, no, wait a second, there's there's something more to this guy. And yeah, he's done some pretty terrible things, but now I kind of understand. And so the really interesting challenge for us will be to kind of take this character and, and bring him to the future and, and see what the next next season brings uh, as far as he's concerned. But we're we're in discussions right now trying to figure out exactly how that's going to work. Can you tell us anything about um, who actually is going to be signed on for the second season? Um, we, I mean, this is so brand new. We just got word yesterday about the, um, about the pickup, so um, we don't know exactly uh, for sure uh, to what extent everyone's going to be in. I know um, we have, um, we have uh, Billy and we have Kira and we have Mark. Um, all signed up for the next season. Everybody else is sort of guest starry, not so much because we didn't intend to bring them along, but because of um, just deal making mm -hmm. yeah. uh, reasons. And so we're gonna, you know, it's it's we, we didn't do we didn't just kill people off to kill them off. Uh, we were very strategic with uh, with when we decided to to get rid of a character. Doreen. God rest Doreen's soul. Yeah. By the way, just to just to let you guys know about Doreen, Doreen was created to die. Yes. Yes. And yeah, she we did never, hear that. Yeah, and she never, we never imagined that she was going to become this beloved character. And then when the show started to air and people were saying, oh, I love this character. She's so different. We were like, oops. <laughs> um, but that being said, it worked. I think it worked really well yeah. because... Give her a twin. Out. There have, you go. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> have her come back as a ghost somehow? No. There you um, go. I have a question for... Okay, so I mean, I know these guys on the panel that I, I'm with, they know a little bit more about how the background stuff works for when a show season gets relaunched mm -hmm. and stuff. How, like, do you have episodes that were kind of written... Like, how does it work? Like, did you guys already have a, a, just a basic idea of where you would want it to go in season two? Have you written any episodes oh, yet whatsoever? No. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean... We don't, until we get the pickup, we don't do any kind of okay. advance work. I mean, the one thing we have done... You have, like, ideas, Yeah, but... we have ideas. We had to go in and we had to pitch to sci-fi yes. and say, hey, here's what we're thinking. This is, you know, uh, uh, some directions we like to go, really broad brush strokes. And what do you think about that? Okay. And uh, so that was part of what led to the So the basically pickup, the, the next question immediately then is how long am I going to have to just be, like, in withdrawal mode until I get to actually see it air again? <laughs> Are we thinking, like, a year? January, probably. Yeah. Probably All the right. same if they do the same. Yeah. yeah. No, All right. I, I don't know for for sure, but I would imagine it would be around the same right. time. I have reason I, to survive to survive past right. into the night. So the year. right, <laughs> Helix, Good, I'm glad. Helix was your first series that was start to finish. You were the showrunner. You were the executive producer. You are the mind that's driving it forward to get it to where it ended up after the end of episode 13. What are some of the challenges you faced when you're signing on for such a large project like this, when it is sci-fi, when they have such a large backing for special effects, for locations? Um, what was some of the challenges you faced with finding locations, knowing where you're going to film, and just kind of putting your putting your finishing touches on it to make it the best it can be? Yeah, um, every project is like the hardest project you've ever worked on, mm -hmm. truly. Even, you know, in hindsight, when you look back and you're at the moment, they're incredibly hard. This show was incredibly hard to get launched. There were a lot of uh, birthing pangs uh, that went on with this show, and um, I don't know why that was. It was just one of those things where um, we were we were constantly having you know money issues where we just didn't have a huge budget. Yeah. We didn't have the normal you know broadcast network budget. You'd never know though. I mean, the well, show is great. The effects we, are amazing. Thank you. And we had some great uh, keys, some great people who are DP Steve McNutt and uh, Guy Lalonde, our production designer, and the, the effects house and uh, all these people who really brought their A game and so took a show that could have looked like crap yeah. and elevated it and made it look really good and then great actors as well. Of so, course. Um, but with this show in particular, it was difficult. Number one, budgetary. Uh, number two, we were shooting in Montreal in the summer. And so all Montreal the in the summer does not look anything like the Arctic. <laughs> yeah. we, we were not going to have any of that. We were not going to be able to go to the Arctic. And so very early on, a lot of our conversations were about how do we get outside of this base? And mm -hmm. we knew most of the show was going to be inside the base. We want claustrophobic. We want tense. How are we going to be able to get outside? And so it was a very kind of uh, uh, hypothetical conversation about can we shoot some snow? Can we make it look? We had no idea what we were, we were going to be able to get away with. And I have to say the production in Montreal, they killed it. 
Oh, yeah. Because the snow stuff, even though you're not getting gigantic landscapes, um, you're getting something. It's very seamless. It, it works really beautifully. And their snow, uh, it was really interesting to watch them shooting snow. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure the actors have told you about how foul that stuff tasted yeah. and, and all that. But uh, <laughs> Mark, I think, was the one who was like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel bad for them. But they did, a, they did a tremendous job with that, with the wind blowing and all that. And a lot of times they just used soap bubbles. And they had, like, soap bubbles flying around because they, they stick to your skin and then they melt. Yeah. And uh -huh. it looked fantastic. It was really amazing. Okay. Um, now, uh, we see the scope widen out at the end of this, this season finale. Mm -hmm. um, they're in Paris. We've got the Ilaria headquarters. Uh, one of the s strengths, and I think this was by design, of the first season was that it was very claustrophobic. It was very intimate. And that's also, uh, like, how broad is the scope going to be in season two? Are we jumping ahead to another, you know, tight 13 days where uh, major events happen in this long chain, or is it going to be kind of globe hopping all over the world? Um, I think I can, I mean, there's a lot that's still in flux sure. right now, but I can tell you this. These are the things that we really liked about season one. We liked the claustrophobic mm -hmm. thriller very much and thought that that worked well for us. We really love the one day at a time progression mm -hmm. of, of episodes. I think so everybody I think, did. I yeah. think that's something we're going to try and, and utilize to, to the best of our ability. Um, we're never going to be World War Z or, or you know, a movie uh, that has global... Um, there, there may be global concerns now because obviously there's been an outbreak in Laris, Puerto Rico and, and yeah. things it's, are it's happening. It's now known. In the, probably the yeah. last episode, we see it in the newspapers in Paris. So, so the world known. is aware of it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The world is aware, but it's never going to be as big as you know, War of the Worlds or something of like course. that. Right. At least, at least in our minds, it's not right now. And part of that is because I don't think the show works as well in that big global context. And also, we can't compete with that. We don't have the budget. We don't have the time. Yeah. So our story is our stories are personal, and they're on a smaller scale, but still have these big twists and turns. But we still like it though, because at the same time, when we spoke to like you know Cameron and stuff, we're like, you know, this is different. This is not World War Z. This is not The Walking Dead. This is not you know about zo you know anything like that. This is something completely on its own. So in a way, you know, the smaller storyline kind of makes it more unique too. Right. And that's just uh, that's just TV drama. I think yeah. does that really well because it's like you take a, what could be a weakness, which is we don't have the time or the money to do what a, a big movie does, a big feature, and you, you say, okay, so what are we going to replace that with? Well, character and good twists, and we have to be more clever because we can't, you know, have a million zombies right. you know, climbing up was that helicopter. A, was that a conscious decision in the end to make it so they were infected with only the Narvik A as opposed to turning them into vectors? Because now when you're in a city, if you're going to open it up to that book, you would need to have all the special effects, all the makeup for so many people running around being vectors in the city, infecting more people, and that's what causes the global decision. Um, but in this case, now you only have to deal with people really dying from this infection. Was that that was a conscious decision to not make the vector be the widespread? Yeah, I mean, and and you know, it's I don't think it's the last we've seen a vector certainly, but um, uh, we okay, wanted that's to, good to know. yeah, we, but we <laughs> wanted to. Um, we wanted to keep it keep it shootable, keep mm -hmm. it contained in some way, um, and also just for the story, it felt like that was the right way to go. Can you tell us whether it was the virus or the cure that Julia passes him at the end of the I episode? I can say it was certainly one of those. Okay. <laughs> can you can you tell us if this is the last we'll see of the monkeys? You know, I don't think we've seen our last monkey. <laughs> yeah. I know. I don't. And I know. <laughs> but, but again, m much is in flux at this point. Oh my so. God. That's how they smuggled it out of the base. The missing monkey. Oh, my oh God. My God. <laughs> the missing... Oh, oh, my God. You, you found the secret. You found the secret. Is that, that was it. Is that it the was truth? the monkey. The monkey's all... They, the, the, it was Dorian's I've monkey. Loved, I've loved all of the theories about how the virus got off the base and the guy going to the hellicopter and all that right. stuff was, was phenomenal. But that monkey, man, it's the, it's the, it's the monkey that disappeared. Or maybe, the or maybe there was because one no monkey, the monkey, one got super burned. monkey Come on. that ran yeah. away through the cold. No, right. it was the one no, that like Doreen had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Got it, okay. Yeah. But, but it was dead. It yeah, was like so cut it could open. still be a yeah. carrier. It could still be a carrier oh. for the for the disease. Because no one would second guess a dead monkey in Puerto Rico. Of course not. Oh, right. Yeah, a dead hairless monkey. They, they just sent yeah. they sent the virus out through Zistagram, you know. Uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, nice. Uh, um, speaking of Ziz, uh, Tell us about the fan reaction. I know you've been you've been working on a lot of series over the course of your career. Lost, mm. of course, major, you know, fan firestorm frenzy. Yep. Um, how has this show's response uh, been gratifying, and how is it different from other shows? It's it's really great. Uh, I I when I was on Lost, uh, I was only on Lost for one season, mm -hmm. and it, it, it the the social media presence just wasn't as as pronounced. Yeah. And now. 
there are shows like this, and there's you know a, a much larger Twitter following, and people are tweeting in real time while they're watching the show, and I'm watching them tweet in real time while <laughs> while uh, they're watching the show, and so it, it's been really gratifying actually to see. It's almost like a live audience. It's not quite live, but it's 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 close enough, and it gives you some feedback as to how people are responding, and you get to see the good and the bad of yeah. that. But people have been very excited about the show. Really, really. Um, our, our fan following is rabid, I would say. They are really, really into the show. They're and vectors. They're, they are vectors. <laughs> um, and they're, they're terrific. I mean, obviously, we want more of them. Um, and hopefully, in season two, we'll be able to, to capitalize on some binge viewing and uh, yeah. to get the, get the fans out. Did Jump. you? Did, oh. Oh, I just had a question on that. Did you expect that kind of reaction? Because I know you guys planned out sort of a, a social media outreach with the access granted right. stuff, which mm -hmm. I've been really keen on like yeah. following and stuff. It's fun because uh -huh. it gives us like a little hint, a little extra. Yeah. We got Save to meet, me! We got yeah. to meet Spencer like a week before. Yeah, that's right. right. Uh -huh. And like this weird little like yeah. people are hitting like, on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, how like how far ahead did you guys plan that whole experience, or did that um, sort of come in at the end? No, that that came early, uh, very early on, and it was funny because we were working on the show, and you know, it's called uh, they refer to it as the second screen experience mm -hmm. um, internally at uh, at Sony and Sci-Fi, and <laughs> so they were asking us, we want to do this great second screen stuff, and what can you guys come up with, and what can you give us, and we're like. Second screen, we're, we're still working on the first screen, <laughs> trying to get this, you know, try to figure out what we're doing. But it was really smart of them. And, and so we came up with, um, actually, it was uh, uh, our assistants who are all uh, fledgling writers and came up with this really terrific campaign. And then we kind of vetted it and checked it out. But um, they really knocked it out, I think, with some, some really cool, interesting little tidbits and things that don't give away the farm, but if you're a fan of the show, they just add to the experience. Yeah. Cool. There, and what I love about it is very enigmatic. Mm -hmm. You get what are ultimately reveals, but it's just enough to keep you curious right. without answering anything. Mm -hmm. And then as you tune in, those gaps are filled. It's right. theory fuel. Exactly. Yeah. And it was really conscious. I mean, we, we were like, let's show, yeah, let's show yeah. the site. Let's can, put them out there. Uh, can oh. you tell us your favorite crazy theory that you've heard over the course of the season? <laughs> oh, God. doesn't have to be from us. My favorite theory. Theory. But it'd be cool if it was from us. <laughs> 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 um, my favorite theory. Well, I love I love the stuff about um, about the how the virus got off the base, right? And talking about the guy going to the helicopter. Yeah. Because honest to God, that guy going to the helicopter, I, I didn't even know he was there. <laughs> um, and so the, when everyone was talking about, but that guy, he was, you know, that's how. And I was like, there's a guy going out to the helicopter. And so the fun thing for us is when something like that happens, and people grab onto it, and you you realize just how into the show the fan base is when they grab onto a little thing like that and say, yes, that has meaning. And you're like, I suppose that could have meaning, but it was not intentional. Right. And that's the stuff that is, the, I think then you know you've got something on your hands yeah. uh, that, that people are into when they're grasping at little um, Easter eggs like that that weren't really even Easter eggs, although some, they could turn into one. Yeah. I have, so, oh, sorry. Well, before we move too far forward, I wanted to jump off with the, so, with the show, social media you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Jumping off that, how much of that do you take into account in the writer's room? Do you encourage the writers, hey guys, watch these live tweets, watch these people, see what the people are thinking, and let's kind of go with a different direction based on that? And especially with the guy walking towards a helicopter, for instance, mm. I mean, if you guys brought that back in the second season as that's how it got off the base in the first place, right. then you could actually say with certainty, okay, we're listening to what you guys are saying. Like, how much does that play into effect? I I, I try not to let it play too much um, because then you start playing uh, a game of, okay, we're gonna try to get ahead of where, where people are thinking. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do, uh, and, and we don't really discuss it a lot in the room, but like someone, we will say stuff like, hey, did you see someone had a theory about, about this? And sometimes, sometimes it can lead you to say, okay, we need to do something else. Mm -hmm. And other times it's like, good. Okay, great. Let them let people think that. That's fantastic. And part of the fun of this show, which I think um, uh, you would not see on most networks, is um, if, if this was a, a big broadcast network show, it would be the show about immortals. Right. From the beginning, and you would know it was a show about immortals, and that would be the show, and it would you know succeed or fail based on that. The fact that they let us do the lost version of the show, where we could mm -hmm. start as a virus show, and then twist and turn and play along week by week and see people get invested in the show and try to figure it out and parse. And I, I think I was talking to, to you guys before uh, we started about how much fun it has been for me to watch this podcast <laughs> and, and to, to watch on Twitter and to watch the deconstruction of the show because it really is in, in some ways kind of the mirror image of what we do in the writer's room. We mm -hmm. sit there and we're like, okay, what about this thing? And, and, and oh, well, no, that's, that's kind of silly, but okay, no, but this is really cool. And sometimes you throw out some crazy idea and it becomes something really cool yeah and then 
what we want is to get the exact kind of reaction that you guys are having when you're watching the show, which is, oh, and, and maybe it's this, and, and I think it's a cloning thing, because, you know, they're not really, Meeks is not really a brother, he's a clone. I love that stuff, because we talked about it in the room, and then said, yeah, let's not go that way, that's too far out for us, but that people are talking about it, and that we're trying to juggle all these balls, and that they're being discussed out there is fantastic. Awesome. Love that. Great. I Which have... one of us is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like asking who's my favorite child. Come on. Yeah. Hello. Well, I mean, Daniel. I mean, uh, Hataki obviously. obviously had one. <laughs> oh. oh. What was your question? I have a question. Well, so I know you guys are just basically throwing ideas for the next season, but what I'm curious about um, that I'm really excited to, to learn. I mean, I, I have a feeling that we're probably going to go more into like learning about Alaria itself and where people come from. Um, but m my curiosity is if you guys are going to tap more into like, because when we originally started with the series, we thought that th the Silver Eyes, whatever the hell they were, came from Narvik. Mm -hmm. And now we're learning that, you know, we, we just learned in the last couple episodes that th this has been around, these Silver Eyes immortal people have been around for like, you know, 500, right. God knows how many years. And I'm curious, so now it's obviously not like a... a, a present like a science thing this is something that was from years ago when they didn't have that technology i'm wondering if we're going to find out how the hell exactly these beings came in because it's not just science i mean 500 years right. ago in feudal japan how the hell does you know like hitaki become this thing well but how do you know that the, the silver eyes do not come from narvik that it did not exist in some capacity i mean yeah way back in the day sure so it's i mean possible. that's what i'm saying like i wonder i mean well, there wasn't we didn't have gene manipulation we didn't have the ability to to uh, uh t piggyback a you know, genetic material onto a virus. Yeah. But who's to say that it the didn't? Root right. that the root was there. And 1500 yeah. science is still science. Well, yes. That's right. But, you know, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, is this it was something... was back then, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this something, though, that is going to be, t like, touched on perhaps yes. more as a subject? Okay, cool. I can cool. say yes, that's, absolutely. That's and we great. almost did it this season. We almost did the origin story. And uh, ironically, it worked out great for us because I'm glad we didn't do it because there's a great discussion to be had about yeah. it. Yeah. But the reason we didn't do it was because of money. Well, oh, okay. Yeah. We, you know, the first thing the production said, you want to do what? And we're <laughs> like, e e no. Yeah. Yes. But then also, if you had done it, it would have spoiled the, like, here's the thing. Like, we, we watched the, the final episode. We're taping this the day before it airs right. on Sci-Fi. Uh, when it goes to, we, we see the normal white screen come up, day, and we're so used to it, yep. and then it's 235, I nearly rocketed <laughs> off into space. You did, yeah. yeah. We you had launched. to pause it so Matt yeah. could pace it out, because yeah. he was just mind-blown. So yeah. excited. Well, because because I, I, it's what I wanted to happen right. for season two. I didn't even imagine it would happen now. So if, if you had gone, you know, day, negative, whatever, right. if we'd gone back, it wouldn't have had that amazing reveal. I guess now I'm wondering, since you have the freedom to go back and forth, mm -hmm. are we going to see, A, the missing days between day 13 and day 235, and are we going to go back even further? Uh, the answer is all things are possible. Great. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, can, we, can we play with that? Absolutely. Um, and, and the day 235 thing, by the way, was a construct. I have to throw out credit to our writer's room, who I was, I think, working on episode 12. Mm -hmm. um, and they came in and said, and said uh, this is Ed Dector, who was one of our, uh, our, our producers, came in and said, we have a pitch for you. And we had talked about possibly kind of giving a little jump start to the next season, just in a tiny way. Yeah. And they, I came into the room and they said, day 235. And I went, sold. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. And so they really came up with this idea. And Sci-Fi and Sony, God bless them, let us do it. I'm, I'm, I was partially wondering where they got that number from, because then I was trying to think, wait, so if if Jordan's pregnant and if she's still alive, because we don't about know. Seven months. I'm, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But I, I I didn't know right offhand. I was trying to think. Wait, did she have the baby yet? Is it is it coming? Is it gonna be pretty? Like it's, right. so, it's one of those things that you just like like oh my god, is that number so you know? Because you don't find out till after you found out about two thirty five. Right. right. So, exactly right. I, I am, I'm, oh, I don't want to wait a year. So, so <laughs> when, shows, oh, when shows start, they have a basic layout for episode 1 through 13, but things change through the season going on. Yeah. When you signed on to this yeah. show, what was, what was the layout going to be, and how has that changed over the course of writing and the, airing? The, the initial show uh, was always supposed to be, from the, from the pilot on, the pilot that, um, that, that Cameron pitched to Sci-Fi uh, with Ron and with Linda Opes, one of our other producers, was going to be this 13-day series. Um, every episode, the idea was that every episode would be a day, um, and initially, um, through, Cameron did like a year of development on this thing, and initially, Immortality was in the pilot. 
Hmm. And one of the notes uh, that we got early on was, and, and, and our feeling too was, let's not have it be about that. Let's, let's extend the mystery. And so let's push it out. Um, and that was something that didn't happen until we started talking about the show. So what happens in these cases is you have a pilot script. The pilot often, and in this case definitely was, was a template for what the show would be, which is fantastic. And it gave the show shape and it gave us something to, you know, to, to be able to pace ourselves. We had to then figure out how fast we were going, what the tone was going to be, who were the characters going to be, um, and there was much discussion about how do we take this pilot script and now extend it and make it into a season yeah. of television. And that's the thing that happens after a show is picked up. You don't know. I mean, truly, you have no idea until they say, "Okay, go hire your writers." You know, you're on this. The, the gun goes off, and, and, and off you go. And that's when you start figuring out, okay, this will happen in this episode, and maybe this can happen there. And it changes. It changed for us because during our season, Sci-Fi, God bless them, um, said uh, right after we gave them the third outline, and the show had a much slower pace to it, a slower burn, mm -hmm. um, and they said uh, we'd like it to move faster, and it was horrific for us because we had to basically take eight stories we had broken, seven after the pilot, and tear them up. Mm -hmm. But what it did is it gave the show pace. And so yeah. it ended up, I think, being a good thing, even though it made us crazy. Hmm. Um, so we had to then, th so that was not based on audience, but that was just based on the network saying, hey, we want a faster And, faster it, and you can tempo. see it because it, it, it becomes this very aggressive sprint yeah. about halfway through the season. You know, uh, we're, we're getting all these details right. for the first four or five. And then once, once we get enough to go on, we just keep running and yeah. running and running. But that was, I mean, that's part of the kind of birthing process of a show. And that's why this one, one of the reasons why it was so difficult is we were initially not going to have the virus be out in the open at Arctic Biosystems until, like, I think episode six. Oh, and oh, wow. so to take it and to move it up so that we're quarantining a, you know, a floor in episode three was a huge, huge change for us. And um, it's something we said, OK, we got the note. We're going to do that. Let's 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 it's a, a different way than how we saw the show initially. But that's kind of part of the birthing process. I think that probably saved the show. And, and I don't it very well may have yeah. because when when I tell when I tell my friends about the show or anything, if anyone ever asks, I, I told my roommate, he's a writer for uh, Teen Wolf. And I was like, you got to watch Helix. And he's like, you know, I watched the first episode. It was kind of slow moving. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, just just watch it. Right. Exactly what I told my friends, yeah. too. And he said as soon as he got to episode three, like halfway through episode three, he was like, all right, yeah, all right. Three's the one where it really takes off. Yeah. And uh, he, absolutely, yeah. He's, he's loved it ever since. Yeah. So I think that's really, that's really what it needed because a lot of shows right now, I think viewers are so much into the here and now mm -hmm. that they don't want the buildup. And I think yeah. that was one of the, the faulty things with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., mm -hmm. of course, was the first five episodes. You're just like, when is this going to get good? They were mm -hmm. all b essentially pilots. Yeah. It, was, uh -huh. it was it was it uh, was it's one of the things that I think hampers broadcast and and you've worked a lot in broadcast. So yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong. I feel like there's a mentality that uh, in order to get the biggest uh, audience possible for the first three to four episodes, you're essentially repiloting the show, reestablishing all the relationships, right. the concept, just in case someone missed the pilot, yeah. they can still jump in. And I think, I mean, for me, that's it, it, there's sort of a fallacy to that, I think, and it definitely is more of a network style, mm -hmm. um, not wanting to, to just trash on the networks or anything like that, but there is a, a sense in a network show of do the pilot, do the pilot, do the pilot, um, and make sure that nobody misses a thing. And the nice thing... Um, about this show was we were not under those same constraints. And I get it, I mean, our audience is much smaller than a network audience, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it was so nice to allow the show to breathe and to do a show. I mean, one of the things that still tickles me a little bit is initially uh, people on Twitter um, and people were commenting on the show and, and people who were re reviewing the show were saying, oh, I don't like the Daniel character, or he's, he's too, you know, he's too one note. And Hataki, he's too, he's a, he, you know, he's twirling his mustache. And, yeah. you know, and I was just like, wait, wait for it. Be patient, yeah. let it breathe, let the show live a little bit. And that's the thing that was really gratifying. I think that's part of <clears throat> what you're in today with the binge watching culture is that people don't aren't patient enough for that week to week build that we got on shows like Lost, that like that's what really got me into television, is mm -hmm. that like that week between because that's when we have time to have these kind of discussions that right. we have on the podcast and build those theories. People just wanna like sit there and watch an entire season at once. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's that sort of mentality that sort of Built it, and I think uh, Sci-Fi put out the first two episodes right, right away right. together, and that was sort of their way to help out. If, yeah. I'm, if I'm correct, and get to, so they can get into that third week and right. be like hooked on the show 
where they can start theorizing. Right, and, and make more of an event of it coming out. Yeah, I thought that was a really smart strategy. I, uh, I just, before we get too far away from the topic, when we were talking about the process and everything, how far in advance, and I'm asking this again because, you know, we live in L.A., but not mm -hmm. everybody who watches the show knows exactly sure. how TV yeah. and the writing works. So how, because I know when Neil came in, who replaced Peter, mm -hmm. we, he was not supposed to be in the series for as long as oh, yeah. he has been. He's right. turned into a completely different character. Yeah. So how... Are you guys, when you guys are filming, I imagine when you're actually taping the episodes, there might be constant changes all the time. Mm -hmm. How far into the scripts are you, like when you're filming episode three, what scripts are already written now? Are you, did you finish the rest of the series and then that no, being? No, we were, okay. we, we wanted to be a lot f uh, farther ahead than we were, a lot okay. further ahead than we were. Uh, unfortunately, because we had to do that retooling, yeah. it didn't happen that way. And so we were playing a lot of catch up. The thing about Neil though is really interesting because initially in the original pilot script, Neil's character was dead. Peter was 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 a uh, he, he was he was a bag of goo. Corpse, he was a bag of goo uh, <laughs> when Al Alan opens the bag and it's mm -hmm. it's Peter. It's his brother and he's bag you know, completely is. exactly bag, <laughs> bag of is. Um, what we did in talking about the show and this was kind of what kind of takes the series allows it to 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 breathe is we said okay let's have instead of a a stranger character who we don't know be the one who's up in the ducks let's have that be the brother let's make that the brother and yeah. have him and then there's an emotional reason for wanting to try to recover him. Still, we were trying to, we were going to have him die in like the second or third episode. Yeah. And then we thought, you know what, let's keep him around. I think there's something to be mined from this. And then we were going to still kill him halfway through the season. And then we, we saw, saw what we had with Neil and was like, you know what, he's really good. Yeah. Let's and so put that's, him on ice for a little while. Yeah, let's put him <laughs> on ice and let's see what happens. <laughs> then let's heal him and, and now let's have him become a huge part of season two. I mean, Neil, uh, part of that is due to just Neil being awesome. Yeah. yeah. Did, so, so part of that, so basically the same thing for season two, we don't know what could happen, whatever ideas you have right now or characters that live or survive or turn into what could still be tweaked and changed oh, consistently. So yeah. guys out there listening, if you're on Twitter, tweet some ideas to these guys. <laughs> it right. might make it into the sure. show. You never know. <laughs> but they have copyright infringement. It really, yeah. <laughs> it really does remind me of when Aaron Paul talks about Breaking Bad and how mm -hmm. Aaron Paul was supposed to die in the first season of Breaking Bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... He, they asked him. They said, "So, so, what would you have done?" It's like, it's like, I, my career would have been over. Like, <laughs> and it just, it, it's, it's not that Neil's career would be over, but it's really, it's great because a sci-fi show like this, and now that it has a second season, it's going to have such a huge following to build from. I hope so. Yeah. From yeah. this. So. Well, like, like Jack on Lost was supposed to die in the pilot episode, yeah. and that's, you know, I wasn't there for that season, but I heard the story about that, and they said, "Yeah, let's not do that. Let's keep him around." And you know, worked out. So the moral of the story is, for anyone that's a writer, kill a character, they will become iconic. That's right. <laughs> yeah. The character you don't kill. Or attempt uh, to kill them. You don't. I'm yeah. curious when in the planning, because I know it evolved at a certain point, when did it, you guys decide to have Peter working for Alaria and with them? Because I was yelling about it in like was, season, in like screaming. episode six or something. From the, like, from the beginning, come on. No, it was very <laughs> late in the process, and um, it's one of those nice things that happens sometimes when you're working on a show you're looking for a twist, you're, you're trying to figure out where can characters go and, and where can we go, especially going into season two. And um, it came out of the room. The room, uh, it was very, very late in the process. And the room, again, came up with this idea. Um, and I think it was Tiffany, actually. It may have been the one who, you know, I'm throwing Gresh. credit. I may be throwing credit <laughs> in the wrong place, but I believe it was Tiffany Greshler. Um, but the, the room pitched this to me and said, hey, what if? And I went, can we do that? Is that, have we done anything that would make that not be possible? And we kind of tracked it back and went through and said, ooh, like that. Right. That is, yeah. that is really cool. Because you left it very enigmatic. Yeah. All we had is that one recording that Peter had made before he was right. infected. Right. Other than that, we didn't know much about him since he and Julia had... Yeah, you get up. like a scene of him, and you also had like the weird uh, hallucination stuff that had uh, gone on with right. him, which wasn't really real, so... Look yeah. at Zach's face. So what? the wheels are turning, because now I'm like putting... Um, because it still feels right. Like, it's such a huge twist, but at the same time, you're like, this... It's not unbelievable. Mm. And now I'm thinking back to that moment in the in the video that he recorded where he's mm. like, does the, the the run sign. Yeah, that's right. And even now, he could that still could be his way of saying, like, I work for them, but you need to get away. I think what it meant, I think it was honestly, it was more calculated than that. And it was 
he knew that Alan would see this video, and that would make Alan very curious. It would make him stay. It would make him okay. stay because it would it would tap into his emotions. It's like that's the thing. This thread with them all season about their relationship mm -hmm. with their father and how uh, it kind of turned them into who they are, and how ultimately splintered their uh, their relationship, their fraternal relationship. And I think that tapping into the older brother needs to protect his younger brother mentality of like he was in over his head. I need to save him. I like that more than what I said, but it does like just add to like this. It still works. Like every piece yeah. of this puzzle. I'm just gonna sit here and do like, this to keep yeah. get, get people talking. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's great is is it is ultimately it is grounded in character, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that that's what the discussion was. Yeah. When you're when you have an, an older brother like Alan, and we see it in their interplay after Peter wakes up and sort of their arguments. Alan has always been headstrong. He's never listened to Peter. He's always gotten all the glory. He got the woman that right. Peter's in love with. You know, and we, we try to explain away the fact that he slept with his brother's wife, but that's still a huge transgression. What kind of person does that? Right. Someone who's filled with a lot of resentment, a lot of hate. We haven't seen it yet. And just remember that in the beginning, he was this guy who was lying there, you know, with the, with you know veins all over his face and, yeah. and didn't have dialogue for, you know, a number of episodes. Yeah. Do you and, need some water? Yeah. And it's stuff that just kind of came in the process of, of breaking a show and figuring out the episodes. This is, this is how you do it. Two things. Um, before I forget one, uh, we never figured out about their necks, why they did that thing with their mm -hmm. necks. Um, just putting or that out water there. water was relevant. Yeah, I thought water was going to be a huge theme, and right. apparently I was wrong. Um, but then it's also the water of life, the what Holy Grail. Life. That's another thing that's yep, kind fountain of... fountain of youth. Yeah. Um, we have talked about that, definitely. <laughs> and then I just want to say, guys, I did say on the past two podcasts that what if Peter knows about the Silvers? What if he knows about everything? And that's why he actively injected himself with the Narvik. And I just actually just now remembered that I said that. <laughs> I thought so many theories that I forget some, some of the time. But it also opens the door to know that... Okay, look at look at the site's relationship with Peter and look at how he talks to him and look at how he degrades him as a human, as this man who's fallible as what he's done. And it still leads me to believe that, you know, Peter, everything he's done is so planned out that he could hypothetically still be a good guy. And that's mm -hmm. what's so amazing with his character because you can turn him into this bad guy, mm -hmm. but since he's still so neutral from what we know about him because he's been on ice the whole season pretty much, he can still be a good guy playing the double agent. He's basically the the Belisarius of. It's, he, in a way, he we're kind of positioning him as the new Belisarius, and so yeah. not to not to say we're going to get rid of the old Belisarius, but we're positioning him in that role in the in the series. And it's the same kind of thing with with Mark and with that Belisarius character. Initially, he was a guy who had a secret. Then all of a sudden, oh my God, he kills Doreen, and everyone hates him. And then we just started to to kind of like just very slowly just tug him back toward humanizing him. And making people go, oh, I hope he gets together with Anana. But I hate him because, sorry, Balls I hate him nanners. because he, you know. Balls and nanners. Balls and nanners. And I, I, you're right, you forget that he killed Doreen at yeah, some point. He killed Doreen. Balls and <laughs> <laughs> Come on. All right. Um, what were you going to say? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm now I can only think of balls and anners. I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it was, it, yeah, I was just going, I was just going to agree based on um, the other thing is, is because we don't know about it, but at the same time, we see these relationships that, that attach people so much because of history or family. And in the end, it's just, I, I can't, I can see him double crossing to this extent, but I can't see when it comes down to it, if Peter would let Alan die. I don't think that, I think that might be a, a come into play next season when, it, you know, stuff really hits the fan. Right. You know, is he going to be, he can't let that happen. Maybe that was a bargaining chip, like whatever happens, you know, don't do this to my brother. So we'll see. That's, but, that's so very interesting. Two You're more, welcome. <laughs> two, more, two more questions real quick I want to talk about. Okay, I'll, I'll knock through this one really quick. I want to know what your reaction was when you got the call for season two. Oh, I, I was... <clears throat> Excuse me, I was fist pumping and dancing around in, in my house. Um, Jersey Shoring. Oh, yeah. Uh, super excited. And, and we had been waiting uh, for this for, for a while, hoping that the pickup would come early. It ended up coming on the later side, but a, a second season pickup is a, is a pickup, and it's, it's amazing. So we're so excited. There's, I mean, we feel that there are seasons to tell about the show, not just one or two. And so for us, it's, it's just it's nice. It's validation, and it's like, okay, we have this core audience, and let's try to build them. Well, just jumping off that, Cameron, uh, he said a few things about how many seasons the show could go for. In your mm -hmm. personal opinion, how many seasons do you believe the show has a lifetime for? I don't know. I mean, the the 
it's very hard to know. And I'm sure, you know, if you asked, uh, 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 you know, Carlton and Damon, or if you asked Vince, how long are your shows going to run? You know, you, yeah. can't, you don't really know in the beginning. And, and shows generally run from, you know, sometimes they're over in a season, sometimes they run for 10. Um, and with a serialized show, it's always hard to know when the right time is to, to say, okay, it's time to stop. When do we do that? And I guess it's something, it's hard to know unless you are, you know, J.K. Rowling and you can say, okay, I'm going to write this many <laughs> books or something like that. Or, or you know, uh, this is a, uh, you know, it's the Matrix trilogy or something like that. It's hard to know how many seasons something will last. I think there's a certain point in time when it starts to feel tired. And that's what you don't want to get to. You do want to always leave people wanting more. That being said, could it run for multiple seasons? Yes. I just don't know at this point when, when we'll reach that place where we're like, yeah, we're kind of repeating ourselves. That you don't want to get to. Are, yeah. are we always looking at a 13-episode season, uh, 13 episode run for each I think season? So. Okay. I think so, yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, uh, uh, Sci-Fi picked up Haven, I think, for a double 13 run. I think it's going to be their last season. I may be misspeaking, but um, I think they're picked up for 26. Okay. And so, so it's not. So we don't know. Like There could I be a so. season that gets so intense it runs for 26 it could. episodes. Yeah, it could. But I think that the idea is that 13 worked really well for us, and the one day at a time thing worked really well for us, and that's something we're going to try to hang on to. I'm very curious because you're talking about Cameron as the creator, and it's that's this is his first project mm. as a, as a writer as a creator. Go Cameron. What's that like for you coming in as a showrunner onto a project that someone else created? It's it's tricky, and I've I've done this uh, pretty much every show that I've run has been created by someone else. I haven't gotten one of my own up yet. Someday maybe, <laughs> um, but um, not for lack of trying. And it's always tricky because you're coming in and you want to do uh, uh, you you want to. Uh, honor the choice of the network and the studio by picking this thing up and say, okay, this is the project we want to do. But a lot of times that also is not spelled out and you're figuring it out as you go. And so it's a weird, it's always a weird kind of mixed marriage. Um, and it's really just a matter of kind of taking what is there in the pilot script and then saying, okay, where can this go? What is our show? How much character are we going to do? What's the tone going to be? In this case, I mean, our tone is really something very different. And that's something that Ron Moore really brought to the game. Um, because we were initially not going to do, you know, do you know the way to San Jose and things like that. And so that's stuff that kind of came in the process of the show um, in many, many discussions. And so these shows kind of take on a life of their own. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the, the pilot is so, you know, the, the network is like, let's do, we want this pilot, you know, exactly that. And other times, which is more this case, you have the pilot and you say, where could this go? It could go this direction, it could go that way, it could lean heavier into drama, it could be more action. And so it's really a finding process. And so that's the thing, the difficult part of any of these jobs is trying to find that process. And when, and when in the process did you come in? Because Cameron mm -hmm. came in and pitched it to Sony, and then they brought in Ron Moore. I think the, I think the order was Cameron working with Linda Obst mm -hmm. first okay. um, with Sony. They paired him with Ron. Ron liked it. Ron and Meryl Davis, his, uh, his producing partner, they went in to, um, to Sci-Fi, and they pitched it and sold it. Not just sold it but as a pilot, but to straight to 13. And then at that point, they needed a showrunner to come in. So that's where I cool. came into the process. Yeah. So it was already sold. It was already set up. All right. uh, now, we're not going to step away from Helix, Helix fans, but I, I do want to expand it out uh, to you know the rest of your career. We, we just uh, we, Before oh, we move off more. of Helix, <laughs> yeah, okay. I have one question. One more. Sure. What are the odds that in season two, someone on screen will say the word Ziz? <laughs> or Awkward Window. <laughs> or Awkward Window. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Window blew let me work up. on that. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let, me work on, let me work on that. We're, we're going to hold you to that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, can't, I can't make any promises. Yeah. Like every uh, episode, yeah. we're just going to be like, <gasps> oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we move on, I just want to talk really quickly about iTunes. Folks at home know that we're expecting this. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, folks, we, we really appreciate your support here at AfterBuzz TV. It's honestly what keeps the lights on, keeps the doors open. We produce over 70 hours of quality content for free every week. It's crazy how much you can get. Uh, but we do need your support in order to do so. It's how we get such great guests like Steve. It's how we get our sponsors. So go to iTunes, rate and review The Helix Show. Rate and review The Creators and Showrunners Show. Five stars. Five stars. Yeah. Thank you. Because it legitimately, it raises the collective water level of the entire network. We love your support, and it, it really is a huge part of what we do. It's a huge help. So thank you. You uh, guys rock. Yes, best fans in the world. Okay, so um, you've you've worked on a whole bunch of series. Mm -hmm. What is 
the moment on screen that you are the the proudest of to to see oh, wow. to fruition? I know that's like mm -hmm. that's a big question, but there's got to be. Who is your favorite child? That's yeah, what we're asking, like, basically. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I don't know that I have a favorite. I mean, the first one is always is always really special because it's the first time that you see actors speaking your lines and yeah. and, and things that you came up with showing up on screen. Um, and it was this little show called Harsh Realm that um, aired in the 99-2000 uh, television season. It was uh, created by, uh, by Chris Carter and, the, and Frank Spotnitz and the folks at X-Files. Um, and it only ran three episodes, or maybe it ran two. I think it mm -hmm. was two. Um, and, but, but it lived on on, on the, the brand new FX channel at the time. This was before FX blew up. Um, and so we did get it, all the episodes aired. And just seeing that for the first time is really special. Uh, and I had worked for a long time. I, I wasn't any kind of overnight success. So I'd worked for a long time kind of on the fringes of the entertainment business and had written movies that didn't get made. And this was my first produced credit. That one was really special. Great. Um, so you've, you've worked in crime. You've worked in, sci in science fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, you did Pan Am, which uh, was a whole kind of Not hybrid. crime or science Love fiction. It. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so love that show. What, uh, you know, what's, uh, what is the through line, no matter what genre you're working on, that you think is key to a great series? Um, for me, I, I, I always have to find something to grab onto in the series and, mm -hmm. and just love. Um, and sometimes it's character, character play. Sometimes it's, uh, it's science. Sometimes it's a great setting. Mm -hmm. um, the genre stuff is generally my favorite, and science fiction in particular. Um, I, I just love these shows so much. Um, I, I, I very much like working uh, outside of the genre as well, or, or on like a, a straight crime procedural or something like that. But my love, I think, is is in the in the sci-fi and fantasy genres. Um, that to me is you can you can tell so many different types of stories, and you can also get points across, emotional, thematic kind of points, without them feeling as heavy-handed as they would if you were in a, a more reality-based um, yeah, for a show. Part of that that I was going to ask, too, is it must be, as a, as a writer, I can only imagine how when you're doing something like crime or you're doing something that has to be based off, like, because Pan Am was based in the 60s, right. right? So, I mean, I imagine you have to also do your research to make sure that you don't oh, screw yeah. up your facts too much. So I imagine that sci-fi, in a way, would be more fun because you can be a little bit more creative and not have to do as much research. Actually, you, I, no? in a way, it, the opposite is true because in sci-fi, you are in places that you can't research sometimes. Yeah. But I, I found anyway, and this was kind of a lesson from X-Files uh, that I learned, which is the more grounded you are at the beginning, the, uh, the better that your fantastic moments will play. And so in X-Files, one of the things we always tried to do was to have the Scully argument, the Scully side of things, always feel like something you'd heard before and something familiar and grounded. So Scully's argument was never like just some crazy, that'll never work. It was always about, you know, there's a, a logical explanation for this that is not rooted in, in science fiction, which is it could be X, Y, Z. And then you, you kind of went, oh, you know, yeah, she's right. That's a really, a really valid point. That way, then when you have something amazing and, and you know, fantastical happen, you're much more willing to, to take that leap. So we did a ton of research for this show. Wow. For, for a show to be successful, I always believe that it needs people in charge to be passionate about it. They need to actually love the product they're creating. Have there ever been any projects that you were asked to be on that you just were like, I'm not a fan of this and I can't, I can't give it the work it deserves? I, I just wouldn't be on a show like that. I, I mean, certainly I, have fa I, I do have favorite children, uh, you know, among the genre shows particularly. Um, but you have to be passionate about it. It has to be the most important thing that you're working on, I, I think anyway. Um, uh, my old boss, Chris Carter, uh, said, and I, I didn't say this to me, but I heard this uh, as kind of an apocryphal story, that you don't dabble in television, mm -hmm. which I thought was really great because you can't, there's so much work involved, and to do it well, you have to be so kind of immersed in it. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to, on the side, I'll write this TV series. I think you just have to be kind of in the center of it. Um, and I think that, for example, I think, you know, the fact that Vince, was, Vince Gilligan was so focused on Breaking Bad during its run is the reason that show is as great as it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you, because you were talking to us before, um, before our podcast, you were saying, of course, this is the first show that's getting past the, the one season mark with you as the showrunner. And I have a great quote from you that's dare to fail early and often. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm I didn't not, say that, didn't I? I'm not gonna call I'm not gonna call Pan Am a failure. You mm -hmm. were brought in to save the series, and of course it did not get picked up for a second season. But how does that experience help you in your career and move forward to be better and knock it out to get the Helix, to get the next series that's going to get a long standing? I, I think um I think that with with series, it's such a subjective thing uh, as to whether they're going to work, whether your show is going to get picked up, whether the audience is going to like it. I, I cannot tell you how many shows I've been on where you, you thread this needle and all these things go right, everything is so great, and then you put it on the air and the audience just goes, eh, not so interested, and you get canceled. Um, and so what's what's fortunate about the television business is that they don't kill you off after after you know a show that doesn't... Um, that doesn't succeed uh, uh, commercially because there are so many, I, I think everybody knows it's not a science. It's not like um, you can just say, okay, if we put these elements together, boom, we'll have a, we'll have a hit. Otherwise every show would be successful. I think some executives think that. Yeah, perhaps, <laughs> but I think, they, I think people know in their heart anyway that there's a little bit of alchemy that has to go on and it's the right idea at the right time with the right cast and the right writers and everything. You know, it has to all go well. And when you do find that thing, you just, Equal Hang on to it. When, yeah. when people are going to open a restaurant, they do. They look at the demographic for the area. They look mm. at their consumer base. They look at everything that's going on in the news. When you're going to start a show and when you're trying to lean a show in a way to make sure that the audience loves it, do you do basically that with what's going on in the news? What are people really big into nowadays? Like I know that like the gay marriage thing is a huge thing right now. Mm. Um, just newsy things that kind of grab people and pull them in uh, yeah i mean uh, I, I think there is some of that but really i think it comes down to what it, you, there's no way of knowing so if you're just chasing you know what is what is hot and topical sometimes that can work and sometimes not for me it's always uh, what do i want to watch okay what would i want to watch as a fan if i want to watch that okay that might be something that's worth developing or researching or getting into trying to trying to figure out and that's what it always comes down to and then hopefully your tastes are on par with it, enough of the audience that mm -hmm. they'll want to come and do it too but really it's just that now i know when uh there's a difference between writing comedy writing drama and the way that the rooms are structured mm -hmm. um you know with comedy the episode is very much written in the room versus i think in drama the stories are broken in the room then people step away to write it and then you give notes um, can you speak to the the joys and challenges of running a drama room? Sure. How do you um, run a show? They're, they're actually they're, drama rooms can actually be really different. Actually, some dramas don't even have a room. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you just talk to. It's kind of a uh, everyone breaks their own story, and you talk to the showrunner, and you do outlines, and uh, that works better, I think, on on serialized. Uh, sorry, not serialized. On, epi on, on episodic shows. Yeah. Where. The shows, the order of shows really don't matter as much. For us, the really difficult thing about this show, this is the most serialized show I've ever done um, as far as needing to know what happened in the previous episode to really be able to move forward. And it was hugely problematic in the sense that when you're breaking ahead, if things are still changing in the current script that you're working on, it's very hard to know what you're going to be leaning on in an episode two, three down the road. Mm -hmm. um, what I like to do, we do have a room. Uh, we do all break together. Um, but at the same time, whoever is going to be writing the episode is is on point for that episode and needs to be pushing the ball forward. And How do you pick that? Like who who gets what episode or um, who it's kinda, writes it's which It's kind of like batting order. All right. It's kind of like a batting order. Sometimes you say, okay, this is a specific episode and we know you're really good with that character, but usually not. Um, it's it's usually more like a batting order. Um, and, and again, there are different ways of doing that as well. Sometimes... Uh, I'm picturing uh, you guys like picking straws and no, somebody's no, no, like, no. gah! It's, it's kind of <laughs> like, it, it's, it's, it's up to me. And, and so I'll say, okay... Um, I think you're going to do this one, and you're going to do that one, and, and, and part of it is also kind of balancing your um, your folks, uh, your writers and producers on staff, someone who may have a little less experience than maybe someone who has a little more experience, and making it so that uh, there's a balance in there, because I also like my writers to produce their episodes, so I have them do as much uh, as possible mm -hmm. on the episodes, because it's less work for me yeah. also, and so it's like, it's like, please grab these episodes and make them your own, and go to post and go I mean, it makes you know, more sense that way too casting because and do all that stuff yeah yeah and and I, i'm part of it too but i just that's how i learned how to do it do you like to play to their strengths a lot like when you have a writer who's like if you had like look at black rain for instance black mm -hmm. rain was a very very um graphic episode mm -hmm. so when choosing the writer for that episode did you kind of look at his previous work and be like okay well this is really kind of not I'm really i mean the the we had i think uh, for most of these episodes we had the writer in place before we knew what the episode was going to be okay. about All and right. so it was more like okay it's it's your turn at the plate and so 
what ideas do you have? Here's some ideas that I have. Let's talk about those. Okay, what, is, what needs to happen in this story? What are our characters doing? Um, where are we coming from in the last episodes that we know where we're moving, moving ahead to? No, we're not going to do that yet. Let's hold that off until episode 12. The, the, those kind of discussions are, are what happens. But really, it's, it's anybody theoretically should be able to write any episode of the show. Um, one of the, I think, the, the most fascinating things about serialized television, what's probably one of the biggest challenges when writing it, is you have all of these characters, you need to keep them distinct, and you need to give them arcs over the course of the season. Uh, how, do you keep, how do you keep all of the arcs straight, and how are you always uh, moving forward that character's point of view? You know, one of the things that I think is, is always true, no matter what you're doing, no matter what the story is, these people have specific point of views. They will always feel that way. Mm. Who's, who's the character police? Do, do, does a show need one, or is everybody dialed in? No, I think you, you do need one, and, and the character police is me yeah. on a show, usually. Um, and, and when I worked for other showrunners, it was them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really who, who is the police, uh, in a way, of the entire show. Yeah. Someone to keep it all straight. And, and I forget things, too, and you have people there. You, we have... Our, our assistants who, who research for us, we have the writers of the show, everybody is so immersed in the show. I mean, you guys are immersed in the show from watching every episode and really talking, talking about it. Think about doing that for one show every single day, let's keep doing that, for every single day over the course of months. And so everybody gets so immersed in the show that they, it's like, wait, wait we can't do that. We did that in episode three, remember there was this thing. And you just internalize it, you get so into uh, the life of the characters that certain things feel right and certain things don't, but at the same time, there always has to be somebody to say, eh, no, we're not going to go that way, we're going to go this way, and that's, that kind of lives or dies with me. Okay. Um, to all aspiring writers out there, you've given a lot of great advice about running a show. Uh, in terms of writing pilots, um, is there something you wish you'd known years ago or a piece of advice you'd give to someone writing their first pilot or trying to sell a show? Um, I, it, it's hard because of all the pilots I've written, I've never, I've sold a bunch of pilots, I've right. never gotten one on the air. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something that I'm still kind of chasing after. Um, I would say the best advice I could give is, is just write, write a lot. Um, know when to be done with a project and, and to let it go and get on to the next thing. Don't just say, this is my one great idea and I have to keep reworking this over and over and over. Um, also, there's so much material out there. I think you really have to, number one, put your best foot forward, but also in your first, I, I've always felt this way, and it's the same with features as it is with television. In your first 10 pages, five to 10 pages of a script, I know if you can write. I can, I can just tell. I've read, I used to be a, a script reader as well, and so I read a lot of feature scripts way back in the day. Um, you must grab your reader and your audience in those first 10 pages of your show, whether it's some incredible situation or um, uh, your characters or dialogue or something. You must reach out and grab them and shake them because there's a stack of stuff that they're reading through on their bedside table, and you have to make yours stand out. So how do you make it stand out? You've got to make those first pages pop so that people are like, oh, interesting, I want to see more. I want to, because that's what you're after, is that if you're feeling like you have to turn the pages and keep reading, you're probably also going to feel like I have to keep watching this. Mm -hmm. So that, that, I would say, is something that I think a lot of stuff that I read doesn't do. People end up starting kind of, you know, kind of sliding in, and, and sometimes that can work. Mm -hmm. um, more often than not, there's something really impactful. It doesn't have to be huge. It just has to be gripping. Yeah, like because I can I can understand like you know like you said Helix it was a little slow in the beginning but it had to be enough that it grabbed someone's attention so necessarily right. the pace isn't always necessarily what's important no, you don't have to speed it up right. it just has to grasp it has to grab you, you in some because I mean you take a look or, yeah because yeah, you take a look at a show like Mad Men mm -hmm. which is very very slow moving mm -hmm. but I mean again look at how many seasons it's had now right. and it's a great storyline great characters so as long but they had that within the first episode so right. as long as you have that substance. And I'm trying to remember what the Mad Men, what like the first, the first couple of scenes were of the Mad Men. The first scene of Mad Men mm -hmm. is Don Draper. He's sitting at a bar and he asks the waiter why he smokes right. old gold. That's right. And yeah. it's it's establishing the enigma of this very confident guy who's you know using other people to fuel right. his ideas. Um, and it's just it's a very well written scene. Yeah. And then also you have 
this guy's boss comes up because the the waiter is black, and the guy's like, "Is he bothering you?" Right. That's so you're right. You're also yeah. setting up the world. You're setting in that up the uh, the politics of the world and, and right. what Time. the expectations were. Yeah. Right. Then yeah. the next, then it goes right to him and his mistress. You don't know that he's married right. at the time, though. Right. So you're Till also end, seeing yeah. that he's sexy and he has a point of view. Spoken and, like a man who will be doing some Mad Men. Uh, yeah, yes. well, I, I, do, I do the after show. Well, Helix, I think, is great because it does do that. Like, it's a little bit of a slow build for those first couple episodes, but then that, that just from the word progress, yeah. right away, you're like, something's up. What is going on in this Right, place? this guy's yeah. up to something. What's mm -hmm. happening here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I kind of want to I want to move it along to um, a little bit of your past, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, we had a few stories about a few other people while we were talking earlier that I kind of want to talk about a little sure. bit more. Um, first of all, you are a graduate of UCL, UCLA. Yep, undergrad. And you were at, you're an alumni from the Theta Chi frat of the Beta Alpha part of it. I am, yep. So I want to I wanna ask you a little bit about this because sure. this, this fraternity is notorious for having successful people come from it. It had <laughs> Steven Spielberg, it had one of the, the co-heads of NBC Universal. It literally just Wikipedia this universe, this this fraternity, and you'll see just so many recognizable Spielberg names. went to UCLA? But no, he went to, I think he went to Long Beach. But uh, it was a, it was yeah, a it chapter was. of the Theta Chi the Frat. Yeah. Okay. I would love to say the fraternity, I, I will say, it's, it's all the fraternity is there. No, uh, I, I, it's funny, because uh, Spielberg, I don't think I don't think he graduated, but he, he, he was in the fraternity yeah, for a while. I don't think so, because I know I heard Long Beach, and then I was something yeah. about uh, he was... So people think that he went to USC, but he didn't actually go to USC. I don't think so. No. But he, no. he's certainly Lucas who went to USC. Yeah. Right. That's right. So t tell me about this, because I know I know brothers look out for them for each other. Uh -huh. How has how has being a part of this fraternity helped you in your career, especially getting started and then being connected with these people now? And whenever you need to call in favors or anything, like how does that help you? I, I don't know that it helped me so much with with career, but it's a great group of friends, um, certainly, and and that's one of the things, uh, you know, just just I think in your life, you're you're you have people who, you know, you, you have friends from school, you have friends from work. Um, it's just having a good contact group to kind of rely on and fall back on. And people do hear things and they pass along information. Uh, so I, I don't know that the fraternity was helpful uh, uh, so much in a specific career, but it was a great social group and a great group of contacts. Um, to, and, and you never know where ideas are going to come from. Also, you bounce ideas thing. off each other. This person knows well, this. Or, or something happened to you that you go, hey, you know what? I wonder if that's something that's that's like, uh, you know, fuel for a show. Yeah. Right. Something like that. And I got to ask because this was this was a while ago. I mean, what year what year did you graduate or as an undergrad? Uh, Eighty-five. Eighty-five. So this is back when hazing was still kind of popular. <laughs> so it's it's a very prestigious fraternity. They had to have some great hazing <laughs> rituals. Can you please tell us a little bit about that? We were, really there was no know. hazing. There was no hazing back then. Uh, yeah. We did a lot of cleaning. Honestly, there was a lot of, uh, the, the, as you can imagine, when you're having parties at your fraternity house, uh, it's a it's a. I'm picturing you with a flock mess. of seagulls <laughs> here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right no, now, I didn't have the flock so of seagulls. Happy. But, I did have, but I did have the nice middle part going at yeah. the time. So. Nice. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, there was a ton of painting and cleaning and just like detoxifying that house. Um, and that was the extent of any hazing that went on. Really, you mentioned I mean, parties, yeah. though. Any, any oh, yeah. like really memorable events that you could just mostly, totally... mostly unmemorable events. <laughs> right. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think I graduated people. in spite of that. So. One time, one time he saw someone drink so much stuff, and he threw up black that's stuff. Right, and yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's where went, hmm. he got the idea right. for Ziz. Uh, you had to have loved Animal House, though. When oh, I loved Animal House. Okay, loved Animal at, House. At, the best. We got yeah. that going for us. Yep. Um, you you were nominated for an NAACP award for the outstanding dramatic series of writing for Daybreak, and it was the episode, What If He Let's Her Go? Do you think your experience with the X-Files and all your shows up to that have really helped you and mold you into the person to create that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't create Daybreak. It was, uh, it, I, I was a, a, yeah. a co-executive producer on the show. Um, but yeah, I mean, every show that you work on, you pick up something else, whether it's something that's, that's good, useful, or it's something like, ooh, I wouldn't want to have that experience again. Uh, I would say that Helix is sort of the culmination yeah. of everything. Um, at this point, and you know, after Helix, hopefully there'll be something else that you know I can take the lessons from Helix and apply them to. Um, and I still don't have that show of my own that I've that I've gotten on the air, um, so I'm I'm still looking for that. But yeah, I mean, you know, I certainly know a lot more now than I did when I started, you know, back on on Harsh Realm many years ago. Your writing really shines through with the science fiction. As you were telling us that you love science fiction, mm -hmm. you love the history behind it, and how you can create something and be creative with it. I gotta say, Brand X from the X-Files was 
an amazing episode. Really loved it. I, I talked to my brother because my brother is a hardcore X-Files uh -huh. fan. He's rewatched the series so many times on Netflix. But Brand X really spoke, like, pulled out to me because it's tobacco. Okay, it's it's people smoking. It makes them grow maggots in their lungs and it eats them from the outside. And then there's the one person who is smokes so much that it kills them right. and he survives it. So it kind of reminded me slightly of Helix with, okay, you, you have this drug that kind of eats you from the inside, uh -huh. and but you have that one person who it affects differently, and that would be Neil in this case. So you, you always pull from your previous writing for what you're doing. Sometimes but, unintentionally. I don't think I even thought about that episode yeah. doing this, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there are some similar themes, some similar things going on. Tell, tell me... What is your dream show? I know you've you've written pilots before. You've written mm -hmm. so many things that haven't. I mean, they haven't come to fruition. You haven't gotten that show. Right. But if you if you were writing a show right now, what would you want it to be? Um, I mean, I, I, something like this. Honestly, it's like uh, Helix to me is a, a really simple idea for a show that has in its in its development and, and as it's kind of become a series has grown into this other thing and that's the part of the process that i really love is uh sometimes you you know exactly what you're going after and you you write that show and it's exactly what the pilot is and other times you write the show and you're like i i kind of know what this is but i'm not quite sure when you find it on the way um, but helix is definitely i mean i love big stakes i love um uh giving the characters some some room to breathe big reveals um, and I like the kind of, uh, I like the offbeat, I like the quirky music, the counterpoint music that we're using. Um, those are my favorite moments in the show, is those moments where we find a great song to put in just the right place, and it's not what you would expect it to be, but it's, it's this moment that goes from, okay, that's a really cool scene, to, oh, that was awesome. When, the you, guys, when you guys yeah. put in Mad World, I was like, yes, you have to put in Mad World. <laughs> Me and Matt were like, yeah. We're like yeah. Mad. yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> well, that was one, I'll tell you something, I learned something from the Mad World um, Thing and from listening to people's comments, which um, I really like that song, and I didn't realize I love how that song. how much uh, screw the haters. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> no, but but Mad World was one that did not play counter. It really played for the emotion yes. of right. the scene. And when I watched it, I went, okay, that that works. I think it works pretty well. It worked. It's worked previously on you know uh, as other people were talking about, but it wasn't playing counter to the scene. And I think that's where we excel mm -hmm. is doing that. And so what Mad World told me is don't do Mad World again. Yeah. Is really? play counter because yeah. it's one of the it's strengths better. of the show. It's much better. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to talk briefly about hiring writers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as the showrunner, you're helping put together a writing staff. <laughs> Obviously, the sample is a huge part of that. Yeah. But can the you hugest. tell? The hugest. Yeah. The hugest part of that. But when you're, you're meeting with people, uh, can you tell us any stories of people who have lost the job in the room <laughs> or just like things that you do not do? when you're interviewing for yeah, deal breakers. I don't yeah. think I've had anyone come in that really, you know... Uh, uh, Get out of my face. You know, uh, drop their pants or anything like that <laughs> right. in, in the room. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of times it's just personality. You mm -hmm. spend so much time with, with your writers, and you spend so much time in, in a room talking with them. You really want to, at least I do anyway, you want to find people that you want to hang out with. Yeah. Um, and it's like, sometimes you just have someone in, and personality-wise, they're not someone you're going to enjoy spending time with. And that, you know, someone who comes in and is just like, ah, and is like, you know, over the top for me is not someone I want to hang out with. And so other people may want that, that kind of energy. I do not, mm -hmm. you know. I want to have somebody who is going to be able to cope with the stress of, you know, a deadline-driven show, which they all are, and just be able to get through that and not, not wig out and still come up with great ideas. I mean, ideas are the are the you know, whether it's ideas in the writing or ideas in the room, that's what you're being hired for. Mm -hmm. And then somebody who is, who is also going to be pleasant to be around because yeah. you're spending a lot of time with these people. What came first, the rep or the first writing job? Um, the, as far as getting an agent yeah. and that sort of thing, uh, that, that was first. Okay. Um, I wrote something. Um, I got very lucky, actually. I wrote, I wrote a script. Um, uh, my very first script was something I co-wrote with a friend of mine. And um, it was awful, and everyone rejected us left and right. And then the first thing I wrote solo, I got an agent. Only one. One, one response. I got a, a ton of rejections and one guy who said, hey, you know what? I'll meet with you. Yeah, and nice. he ended up being my agent for, for the next couple of years. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But um, So the rep came first, and then it was a couple of scripts after that before, I, uh, before something sold. Mm -hmm. So going back to what you said about the type of writers you hire, basically what you're saying is you want to hang out with us after this and get a drink. There you go. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> no, but that's true. That's true. You want to have people that that are comfortable working in a high stress environment and not not wigging out and just pleasant people to be around. So I, I want to ask real quick. This is this might be a little bit of a weird question, mm -hmm. and if you don't answer, that's fine. 
Um, uh -oh. <laughs> no. Walking Dead has suffered a little bit from having a different showrunner every season, basically. Uh, have and they suffered? Uh, I don't know. I mean, creatively, you think? Creatively, yeah, I think okay. so. With with the quality of the writing, I, uh -huh. I believe so, in my personal opinion. Or it's hard to maintain consistency. Yeah, yeah. maintaining consistency. That's uh -huh. a better way of putting okay. it. Um, and we actually had Glenn Mazzara in here last year for uh -huh. an interview, and he said that he was leaving the series because it was a mutual understanding. He was right. doing his own show. Right. What do you think, because I know you want to do your own show eventually, mm -hmm. would you be? Would you leave the Helix showrunner position to create your own show if it was picked up as a pilot? It's certainly not right now. I mean, I'm not, I don't have anything that's like in the, you know, stage Works. of development where I'd have to go and, and jump off uh, because I've been on the show and so there's, there hasn't been the time. Do I want to get my own show up eventually? Absolutely. Um, at this point in time, though, excuse me, it, these jobs are, they're very hard to get, obviously. Y you... To have a show that you really love working on is also very rare. Um, and, I, and some of the shows I've worked on, I, I, again, I find a way to, to like them, you know, and to, to find, like, the cool part of the show that I can really wrap my head around. This show hits that on so many levels for me. Um, I mean, it's not something I'm thinking about right now. But, yeah, at some point I would like to get my own show up. That being said, I'm enjoying this a lot. Great. And then you told us a little bit about Vince Gilligan working mm -hmm. with him on the on the X Files and how he liked to rewrite a thing. Can you tell us a little bit more about working with Vince Gilligan pre, uh, pre Breaking Bad? Uh, sure, um, Vince. Uh, I think I mentioned to you guys before. Truly, one of the like top three or four writers I've ever worked with. Um, just somebody who, when you read Vince's scripts, it was like, oh my God, what, what has this guy done? And Vince used to rewrite us like crazy. I was one of the younger writers on the show, and you'd get a script back and it was like, oh my God, what what has he done? And, um, and then you'd read it and you'd go, oh, oh, that's good. Oh, that's really great, too. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, and so, yes, the, the rewrite was savage, but it was always really smart and oftentimes much better. Great. All right. Well, I think we kind of need to wrap up. I think we've held you here hostage. We've kind of sure. been pulling you, pulling you like Spencer for a while. <laughs> In the white Tying room. you to a chair. Don't um, call me that. Yeah, don't call me Spencer. <laughs> It's been such a pleasure. It's been amazing to have you in here talk thank about you. Helix. Yeah, I mean, especially me. after watching the finale, because we right. definitely needed to have you after watching it's the finale. It's so yeah. good. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. People that. are going to lose yeah. their minds. They, Love that. They yeah. really are. Um, where can we find you on Twitter, and when can we expect to hear news about season two and know when it starts filming? Um, our plan right now, if we stick to it, would be um, would be to start shooting in July again. So we'll see if that happens. Um, and on Twitter, I'm at, at Steve Maeta. All right. Very simple. And Zach? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at that Zach Wilson and also here at AfterBuzz on Grim, Archer, and Resurrection. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter at Matt Lieberman, M-A-T-T-L-I-E-B-E-R-M-A-N. Uh, you can find all my AfterBuzz shows, sketches, and source-fed videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Matt Lieberman. And you guys can find me at Lizzie Maui on Twitter and Instagram. Follow me. And you can find me on Twitter at Steve Lemieux, S-T-P-H-E-N-L-E-M-I-E-U-X, as well as on the Twisted After Show, the finale next week. Thank you so much for joining us today, Thank Steve. You Thank uh, you. Thank you. And girls. <laughs> this has been a AfterBuzz TV showrunners slash Helix podcast for the fans. Be sure to tweet us and subscribe on iTunes. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we will see you for the finale after show on Monday. All right. Sounds great. Thanks. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. See you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals. Thank you for watching AfterBuzz TV on YouTube. For more of your favorite after shows and interviews, subscribe to our channel here, and be sure to share your opinion on the episode in the comment section below here. We'd love to see what you guys are buzzing about. Thanks again. Buzz you later.